uh, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Canada, Ukraine, South America, and India. And her work has been on managing programs to meet the needs of vulnerable and marginalized communities, such as the youth, injection drug users, sex workers, and the healthcare providers who serve them. And today she is going to be uh, talking to us about um, uh, HIV, and um, I will uh, ask that you please uh, save all of your questions till the end, and um, also keep yourselves on mute, and uh, we will answer questions as we go. This um, program is being recorded, and I will hand it over to Ms. Levin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. So let's talk about syringe exchange and health disparities and why should we care. So there are a number of reasons why should we care. For one thing, 8% of new infections here in the United States are attributable to injection drug use. That's 11 people every day here in the United States. Injection drug users are twice as likely to have HIV and not know it. And this is especially important because it's those who have HIV and don't know it who are more likely or actually most likely to transmit HIV. For those of you who are interested in not just in domestic issues but also global issues, what we find is that injection drug use is not just an issue for the United States but actually internationally as well. Outside of Sub-Saharan Africa, three out of ten new infections of HIV are attributable to injection drug use. So right now we have a ban on federal funding for syringe services programs and that ban not only applies to domestic HIV programs, but to international HIV programs as well, such as PEPFAR. So there are actually folks in USAID who said that they would like to use their dollars to support syringe services programs abroad, but they can't because of this existence of a ban on federal funding. Back to the United States, when we're talking about syringe services programs, we're not only talking about preventing HIV, we're also talking about preventing viral hepatitis. And this is important because here in the US, hepatitis C is the leading cause of death among people who have HIV. And there are actually four times as many people living with HIV, excuse me, four times as many people living with hepatitis C than HIV here in the United States. And because of that, hepatitis C is actually now the leading cause of liver transplants here in the United States. Another reason why we need to talk about syringe services programs more so than ever is because we now have an, an epidemic of prescription drug use. And this is manifesting in a number of ways, increasing rates of HIV, increasing rates of hepatitis C, and increasing rates of drug overdose. In fact, at this point in time, we actually have more deaths attributable to injection, excuse me, more deaths attributable to drug overdose than to motor vehicle accidents. And we should care because, of course, health care is right. So there's some very broad concepts in terms of why we should care about this. Let's talk about some specifics. So specifically, here are a couple of my favorite people. When we're talking about syringe services programs and injection drug use, we're not only talking about injection drug users, we're also talking about their sexual partners, their children, the community at large. So looking at Reggie, he contracted HIV and hepatitis C through injection drug use and willingly transmitted both of them to his wife, who then unwittingly transmitted hepatitis C to his youngest son. Looking to the right photo, we've got Z, who is never injected, but she contracted HIV from the father of her children because uh, he himself was an injection drug user. Both folks were able to access HIV treatment in a very timely manner and were able to live 20 years with HIV disease. Unfortunately, Z passed away a year ago this month, so while we do have treatments for HIV, we definitely do not yet have a cure for this disease. Something that would be helpful to hear from you all is uh, where you registered to vote and are you planning to come to this year's National AMSA Convention here in Washington, D.C., and are there any burning issues you would like me to address? So the theme of this week is health disparities issue. Is this a health disparity issue? Well, the answer is yes, absolutely. When you look at injection drug users, African Americans and Latinos are twice as likely to have HIV than their Caucasian counterparts. Is this something new? No, this is something that's been going on since the very beginning of the epidemic. And I use this slide from the CDC to illustrate that fact, that whether we're looking at HIV or AIDS, new cases, cumulative cases, death rates, African Americans are always disproportionately represented. So our Latinos are always disproportionately represented. 
if those of you, for those who are interested in local data, here's some local data that's here very briefly. I just want to let you know that this PowerPoint is intentionally packed with lots of information. When it's going to be posted, it's not going to be in a PDF form so that you can use it and take out the parts that you want and put in the parts that you need. So that way you can really tailor it to your own interest. So this is intentionally giving you more information than you could possibly use for one particular PowerPoint. So this is something I want you to be able to use continuously for a number of different presentations. So we talked about how African Americans and Latinos are twice as likely to, who are injection drug users, twice as likely to have HIV than their Caucasian counterparts. What about new infections? So those are, it's an old issue. What about right now? Who's getting infected now? Is this still a health disparity issue? And the answer is yes, African Americans are actually 11 times and Latinos are five times more likely to contract HIV through injection drug use at this point in time. So it's not just in terms of existing cases that there are health disparity. In new cases, this is absolutely positively a health disparity issue as well. One of the questions I sometimes get is, well, why do we have to worry? Why do we need to focus so much on syringe services programs? Why can't we use pharmacies? Well, there are a few issues. One is that over-the-counter availability of syringes varies widely from state to state. Sometimes it's available, but you have to show photo ID. Other times it's available, but you actually have to sign in your name. Also, just because they're available over the counter, that's not all that a syringe services program does. They have syringe services programs offers a number of services such as use syringe disposal, HIV testing, drug treatment referral. Pharmacies typically don't offer all these other ancillary services that are so valuable. In terms of health disparities, we also see health disparities playing an issue here when it comes to pharmaceutical access and over the counter syringes. One of the things that we notice is that when you look, when you look at where pharmacies are located, they tend not to be located or less often located in communities of color. So just as we have food deserts, we have deserts when it comes to access to pharmacies. Also, just because a pharmacy can stock syringes for sale over the counter doesn't necessarily mean that they do. And when you map out which, which pharmacies actually stock syringes for over the counter sales, they tend not to be located in communities of color. Also, one of the things that we see is that when syringes are available for purchase over the counter, the pharmacist always has the discretion of being able to say, no, I don't think you, I'm going to sell these to you because I believe that you're going to use these for drug use. And when you look at who's turned away from these services, who's not allowed to purchase the syringes over the, over the counter, it's disproportionately African Americans and Latinos who are turned away. So while it's important to have pharmacies available because they're available seven days a week, sometimes 24 hours a day, it, Pharmacies are really a complement to rather than a substitute for syringe services programs. So I've talked about a little bit about syringe services programs. Let's talk about what they're really all about. And they follow something called a harm reduction philosophy, which is really about meeting people where they're at rather than where we would like them to be. The goal is not necessarily abstinence from drug use, but self-determination. And this is very different from the kind of training that we received in the medical community. What we're, what we're told in communities that our job is to find out what the problem is. If there's more than one problem, figure out which problem is the most important one to fix first, and then fix the problem. So it's very different from what we see in harm reduction because what we we're taught to do is to tell the patients, this is what your problem is, and this is how you fix it. In harm reduction, it's how can I help you today? It is a patient-driven agenda. And sometimes medical students have a problem with that because they'll say, well, we really think people really shouldn't be using drugs, so we should be recommending drug treatment every single time that we see this patient. And the problem is that doesn't work. The clients already know that drug treatment is available when they're ready, and if you were to mention it every single time, what would happen is they would tune out, they would turn off, and they would stop coming. And it's very hard to do an intervention if the patient's not there to receive the intervention. So the question is, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? And if you want to be effective, you need to take a harm reduction approach. One of the things that harm reduction does is it looks at the person in the greater context of their lives. So one of the things that we see is that folks are oftentimes self-medicating for other psychiatric issues. So for example, I have patients who are using cocaine to self-medicate for their bipolar disorder to balance things out. I've got other folks who are using heroin to get the voices in their head to chill out. Here in Washington, D.C., 64% of the female injection drug users have a history of sexual trauma. Our difficulty isn't convincing our clients to access psychiatric services. Our problem is that those psychiatric services simply are not available. 
And so when we're looking at a hierarchy of needs or concerns, drug abstinence may not be the top priority. I also want to draw your attention to the photo that's in the upper right-hand corner. One of the things that we're talking about when we talk about harm reduction is not just about not sharing needles, but we also don't want people reusing needles because, as you can see, the, down, the needle gets damaged for every progressive time that you use it, increasing the chances of causing injury. And one of the misunderstandings about harm reduction is people tend to think that sort of this new age philosophy that's very radical, that isn't used very often, but actually harm reduction is an approach that's used in a variety of, of venues. So for example, in nutrition and exercise, we encourage people to walk rather than take an elevator. In nutrition, we encourage people to have whole fruit rather than juice. Uh, we encourage people to wear a seatbelt, to wear a helmet when they drive. And when it comes to preventing HIV in terms of safer sex, we always say abstinence is best, but if you're going to have sex, use a condom, get tested. So the harm reduction approach is nothing new. It's something that we use all the time in a variety of contexts. And in terms of what happens as syringe services programs, it's not just about preventing HIV and viral hepatitis, but it's also HIV case management, re referral to drug treatment, treatment of injection-related wounds, case management, employee, employment assistance, a whole variety of services tend to be offered at these syringe services programs. So in terms of reducing health disparities, where we're talking about health disparities in terms of HIV or viral hepatitis or access to substance use disorder treatment, syringe services programs do what no one else does because they reach communities that no one else is able to reach. And so if we want to really address health disparities, we really need to provide support to syringe services programs. One of the things I want to talk about is access to buprenorphine and Suboxone. One of the stereotypes we have about people who use substances is that they're very unmotivated, they don't take an interest in their health, and that's actually not the case. One of the things that we find is that our clients don't like methadone. Uh, they find it sedating because there's a potential of abuse. They have to go in every day to the meth clinic. They're waiting in line with people they want to avoid. The clinic's only available during traditional working hours. Is, which is very hard for them if they have a job. So they would actually prefer to use something else, and something else is buprenorphine or suboxone. Buprenorphine is something that's just given sublingually. You can't get high from it unless you inject it. And so here in the United States, it's offered in the form of suboxone. Suboxone is just buprenorphine with a little bit of naloxone in it, so even if you inject it, you can't get high. It's, there's no potential for abuse. Here in the United States, about 17 states include Suboxone in their Medicaid formulary. What we find is that states that don't have Suboxone included in their Medicaid formulary is that there's actually a black market for Suboxone. Again, because there's no potential for abuse, you can't get high from it. What we're having here is a black market for treatment of substance use disorder. What we have is literally a Dallas Buyers Club situation for the treatment of substance use disorder. So I've talked a little bit about what the services are that syringe services programs offer, what the philosophy is behind syringe services programs. Now the question is, do syringe services programs work? And the answer is yes, absolutely yes. In fact, because of the syringe services programs, we reduced HIV incidence within this population by over 80%. This is a success story. This is an HIV prevention success story that's second only to the prevention of vertical transmission here in the United States huge success story. However, we're not going to get to an HIV-free generation within this population without access to federal funding. Do syringe exchange programs prevent viral hepatitis? Yes, absolutely. And we've got some really good data and I'm going to show you momentarily. However, there is a, because hepatitis C is so much more contagious than HIV, you have a much more limited window of opportunity. What we find is that people will contract hepatitis C, 50% of people who inject will contract hepatitis C within the first five years of shooting up. So we have a very limited window of opportunity to engage in. Does it reduce drug use? Yes, it absolutely reduces drug use. It does so in two ways. One is the harm reduction philosophy, which acknowledges that any change, no matter how small, is to be acknowledged. What we find is that people who are in harm reduction programs or in the syringe exchange programs use less often. It also serves as a very important bridge to drug treatment. Another thing that one, another very important public service that syringe services programs offers is that it's pro, it properly disposes of used syringes, which is a service that pharmacies and other facilities don't provide. 
And what we find is that when you have a syringe services program, neighborhoods get cleaned up, parks get cleaned up, beaches get cleaned up, because now people have a safe place to dispose of their syringes. Is it cost effective? Yes, it's absolutely cost effective. For every dollar you spend on syringe services programs, we save $7 in HIV treatment alone. That's just HIV. That's not including viral hepatitis or secondary infections like endocarditis, not including injection-related wounds, not including drug overdose. Just looking at HIV for every dollar that you invest, you save $7 in HIV treatment. Most pop people actually like syringe services programs, and I'll show you some stats on that in just a sec. And the reason why I'm talking about how so much support that syringe services programs get from various communities is to emphasize the fact that when it comes to supporting syringe services programs, it's the federal government that's really the outlier here. But let's look at where syringe services programs exist in the United States. So you can see that from this map that they exist everywhere. In terms of who's paying for it right now, federal funds cannot be used to pay for them. So who's paying for it? Well, it's not individuals and it's not foundations. It's actually state and local governments. The vast majority of the funding comes from state and local governments, about 83%, which is an indication of popular support, of local buy-in, and again, emphasizes the fact that the outlier here really is the federal government. I do want to talk about one of the stronger selling points of syringe services programs is that they help clean up communities by providing a safe place for people to dispose of their, their used syringes. And I want to highlight the third bulletin because this is research that actually medical students did. What they found is that in Miami, there are actually eight times as many improperly disposed syringes as there are in San Francisco, despite the fact that San Francisco has twice as many injection drug users. And the reason why is because of syringe services programs. In terms of how prevalent all these ancillary services are that I mentioned, here's a quick study that shows that most of the syringe services programs offer a wide variety of these additional life-saving services. And in terms of local data showing that syringe services programs reduce HIV as well as hepatitis C, here's an example of that. And I want to talk real quick about one of our sort of non-traditional supporters that we find that law enforcement, including the Black Police Officers Association, supports syringe exchange. And the reason why they do that is because law enforcement are vulnerable to needle stick injuries. When they do a pat down or when they do a search of an individual, they tend to get stuck by needles. And when there's a syringe services program in the area, people have a safe place to dispose of their used needles. And they can also reveal the fact that they have a needle to law enforcement without fear of being arrested. And so what we find is that we get a lot of support. In Connecticut, for example, once there was a syringe services program started in, in, in Hartford, Connecticut, needle stick injuries to law enforcement decreased by 66%. In terms of cost and cost effectiveness, again, I mentioned for every dollar you invest in syringe services programs, you save $7 in HIV treatment. Well, who's paying for that HIV treatment? Well, the biggest payer of HIV treatment here in the United States is the federal government through Medicare and Medicaid. So not only are we saving dollars, we're saving federal dollars, and not just any federal dollars, but we're saving entitlement dollars rather than discretionary funds. And some local, here's some local data on cost savings. And then I just want to talk a little bit more about, even though we've had this incredible success story in terms of reducing HIV among injection drug users nationwide by over 80%, our work is far from done because we now have this new epidemic of injection drug use, and it's being fueled by the epidemic of prescription drug use. Firstly, people are injecting prescription medications. So, for example, in Appalachia, 30 to 60% of the people are injecting, injecting their OxyContin. Another thing that we're seeing, not just in Appalachia, but across the country in New Jersey and in Washington State, is that as prescription medications, prescription pain medications become less available, people are transitioning to heroin because it is less expensive and it's easier to get, and they tend to be injecting that heroin. So we've got a whole new generation of injection drug users coming in, and we need to be able to provide life-saving services for these folks.
In terms of who actually supports syringe services programs, well, here's a whole list. So first and foremost, AMSA, the American Medical Student Association, supports syringe services programs, as well as many members of the faith community. I think there's a general consensus here that people understand that syringe services programs prevent HIV. They do not increase drug use. They actually serve as an important bridge to drug treatment. What was found once was that um, in New Jersey, for example, they received federal funding for syringe services programs. 22% of their clients entered drug treatment within their first year. SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, did a study looking at the needle exchange programs that it funded compared to the other grantees. And what they found is that not only did syringe services programs get people into drug treatment, but they were more effective than their other grantees at getting people into drug treatment. So not only do they do a good job, but they do a better job than other folks working in the same field. So let's talk about this ban on federal funding that I keep mentioning. So for 22 years, there was a ban on federal funding for syringe services programs. Then President Obama was elected and the ban was lifted. And during a two-year period when the ban had been lifted, the uh, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, the CDC, and HRSA all put in money to support syringe exchange programs. Another potential source of federal funding for these programs would have been Indian Health Services. Unfortunately, the ban was reinstated two years later, so they didn't have time to really consider whether or not they would participate in it. But there are a number of different sources of federal funding available if the ban should be lifted again. There are, couple, there are several different things that are very important about lifting down federal funding in addition just to access to federal dollars is that it actually opens the doors. What people found is that once the ban on federal funding had been lifted, whole new sources of funding streams had become available because it was seen as a seal of approval. Well, if the Fed supported, then we should support it too. And we need it more than ever. So for example, we know that state and local budgets are dwindling. And so we need to have another, we need an extra infusion of cash in order to reach an aid free generation. So looking at Washington state, for example, there are 13 counties that previously had received state funding for the syringe services programs. Now, because the state's budgets are dwindling, only one out of 13 now receives state funding for the syringe services programs just because the money simply isn't there, not because they don't work, the data is abundant that they work, but the money isn't there anymore. And another issue that we find to be particularly appealing to our non-traditional allies is that's really about local control, that local communities know how best to respond to their epidemics. So when it comes to spending their federal HIV prevention dollars, they should be making the decision about how that money should be spent. In terms of additional talking points about lifting the ban, the most important thing to understand about lifting the ban for federal funding is that lifting the ban costs nothing. It simply allows localities to spend their federal dollars as they see fit. And that's one point that I can't emphasize enough because people say, well, these are very tight fiscal times. Lifting the ban actually costs nothing. It simply allows localities to spend their federal dollars as they see fit. But is it cost effective? Yeah, for every dollar spent, you save $7 on HIV, uh, HIV testing. In terms of cost effectiveness, the gold standard is considered childhood immunizations. That's for every dollar you spend, you save $5 later. Well, here we're saving seven. So not only meeting the threshold, we're sort of exceeding it. Whom are we trying to convince? We're trying to convince members of Congress. This particular issue is not something that's gonna be voted on as a bill in the House or the Senate. It's something that's going to be decided in the, in the Appropriations Committee. So in terms of who's our target, our target is the Appropriations Committees. The Senate has, support, has historically supported lifting the ban on federal funding. So what we're asking for them for this year is Please keep, the, please keep the original language that you've, you've had and fight for it. In terms of tiering whom you want to target, first and foremost, you want to target the leadership. So Cochran and Blunt would be your first top, your top choice. The second choice would be the subcommittee on health. Uh, the, the leadership has been named, the membership has not yet been named. However, the membership is gonna come from the full committee. So if you see here on the right side, one of your representatives, that is your target audience because it's gonna be one of those people that's gonna be on the appropriation subcommittee on health. That's your second tier. Your third tier is anyone who's on the full committee of appropriations. And that's the Senate side. There's also the House side. In terms of tiers, who's the most important person, the most important people are Rogers and Cole, who are the Republican leadership. 
The next tier is the, the subcommittee on health. Republicans have named theirs. The Democrats have not, but they, they should shortly. But they're going to be brought in from who, who, the general membership, which is listed here on the right side. So in terms of whom you should target, if you see your representative here, you are an especially important person. So what can you do? There's a lot of different ways that you can get involved. The easiest thing to do is to go to the website, amfar.org, slash end the band. There are films that you can watch. There are petitions you can sign. There are write-in letters with call-in scripts that you can use. All you, have to, you don't even have to know who your representative is. All you have to do is put in your zip code. It'll show who your elected representatives are. You can cut and paste the letter, put in some of your own personal anecdotes, hit send and you're good to go. You can also get the word out in a number of different ways. You can host a film screen, post links on Facebook, send a tweet, share on listservs, lots of different ways. You can call your representative Congress. We provide a sample script. You can do an op-ed or a post. You can work with your local SSP, your syringe services program. If you're not sure where your local syringe services program is, you can go to this website, NASEN, and just put in your zip code, and it'll tell you where your local syringe service program is. And if you, again, if you're not sure how to get involved, go to amfar.org slash end the band. If you actually go to that website, this is what you see. You see that we've got a number of different films the first one is 10 minutes. It's called End the Band. Then we've got three shorter films. Together, they total about 10 minutes. They make for a great lunchtime presentation. If you scroll down further, you can see a petition. That also makes for a good lunchtime presentation. You can show the film and then have people sign it afterwards. There's also the, the link for contacting representatives in Congress and the House and the Senate, as well as additional briefs if you, in case you want to get more information. And here what we have here is a list of all the talking points in terms of advocating for lifting the ban on federal funding as well as a list of ways to become involved. And what I'd like to do with the remaining 10 minutes or so uh, before we open it up to questions is to talk about ways that medical students can get involved. So here are some quick examples of medical students making a difference. Students had a lunch, the Georgetown AIDS Advocacy Network had a lunchtime brown bag lunch. They showed the first Amphar film called End the Ban. They followed that up by passing around the petition. This motivated students so much that they actually went on the Hill and lobbied on the issue themselves. And here they are being photographed with their senator, Senator Portman, uh, as a result of this one AMSA event, one AMSA event that was hosted. Later on, we showed the three remaining films. It was a total of 10 minutes. This motivated students so much that they decided to go lobbying again. And this time the issue was HIV criminalization. And this is an example of students making a difference because what happened is on the House side, the bill had been introduced and had a number of co-signers. On the Senate side, it had been introduced, but not a single co-signer. So the two medical students met with the representative, Senator Markey's office, and explained the bill, and the, the staffer said this makes sense. And so within two days, because of these medical students, this bill got its second co-signer. Some of you may be coming to Washington, D.C. That's a fantastic opportunity for you to go ahead and meet with your DC office, your DC office directly. This is very important. A lot of folks prefer to meet with the local office because it's more convenient. The problem is you want to make sure you're talking to the right person with the right message. And if you meet only with the local office, that doesn't happen. And sometimes a lot gets lost in translation. So in terms of priorities, if you can meet directly with the DC office, that's fantastic. If not, your second bet best bet is to do a conference call with the DC office. Just send them an email saying, listen, you know, we're, we're in your district, we'd like to arrange a conference call. A lot of offices nowadays are willing to do that. If you need help setting up an appointment or setting up a conference call, let me know and I'd be more than happy to help you do that. Push comes to shove, if the final option is a meeting with the local office, go ahead and have a meeting with your local office, but then follow that up with a letter that you send directly to the DC office. So that way you get to control who sees the message and what the exact content of the message is. And another thing that's, that's very important is to always follow up with a thank you note. It may seem like a very small thing, but it shows that you're serious, that you're well organized, and it also gives you another bite of the apple. So if there's something you neglected to mention during your meeting, you can mention it. And if there are any important points you want to reiterate or any additional information you want to provide, you can go ahead and provide that in your thank you note. Other examples, this is an example of an op-ed that a medical student published in favor of lifting the ban on federal funding. Here's some example of bird dogging that was done on behalf of AMSA. 
this is a fantastic example in Florida. These are the students I was telling you about who did the research that found how in Miami there are eight times as many improperly disposed of syringes than San Francisco, even though San Francisco has twice as many uh, injection drug users. So they used that as the basis to put together a piece of legislation. What they did that was brilliant is they used their status as medical students and reached out to other medical organizations within their state to get them to support this piece of legislation. So the legislation was introduced. Uh, they didn't get a chance to vote on it in 2013 and 2014. Both the state Senate and the state House of Representatives voted on it, passed it, but unfortunately the, the language was not identical and they didn't have time to resolve those differences before the session ended. So it's being reintroduced again. Uh, it was reintroduced, excuse me, last week. And so because of medical students, Potentially, Miami could have its, actually the entire state of Florida can have its first legal syringe services program. In the, inter, in, the, in the meantime, they're still doing research looking at how much not having a syringe exchange program is costing them so that they make, that way they can have, make that cost effectiveness argument as part of their advocacy. Just taking a quick break here, this is a, some photos of me doing some work with injection drug users in India. I just want to show you a few more slides. Before I was talking about you know, general policy issues, I'm going to talk a little bit more about working with your local syringe services program. We talk a lot about syringe exchange in terms of preventing HIV, but also it's important in terms of preventing injection-related wounds and other health concerns. These last three slides I just want to point out to you were actually not from India, but actually took place in Washington, D.C. And I bring this for the, very specifically because I know a lot of are very interested in international health, but it's important to recognize that we've got third world conditions here in the United States, so we need your help here too. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to point out these slides. The other reason why I wanted to point out these slides is that even though when I was in India, as you can see, there were dirt floors and there were no plastic, there were no latex gloves even. Even then, this is in 1996, buprenorphine was the standard of care. And that's important to recognize because these folks, these folks were 20 years ahead of us when it comes to providing treatment for substance use disorder. So it's not just, <clears throat> how do I say this? Um, we've got a lot to learn from them. We've got a long way to go when it comes to doing right by our communities. So what can medical students do? Um, one of the things is just help document the issue. So the photos that I showed you of the, the folks in Washington, D.C., that was done as a part of a community-oriented primary care project. Uh, at George Washington University, provide documentation of the extent to which we have injection-related, the prevalence and severity of injection-related wounds among injection drug users. And it provided the basis for us to change the way we do things. So instead of offering materials ad hoc, we provided a wound care kit. It also provided baseline data. One of the things that the students have seen is that when they're on the mobile unit, it's very, how do I say, it? it's like family. Everyone's very informal, so the shirts come up, the pants come down, and we see these injection-related wounds. When we say, please let me take you to the emergency room so that you can get treated, uh, the folks are very resistant to go because they've been treated so poorly. So the medical students, having seen the, how, that resistance, said, well, we want to offer those services to members of this community. And so the Hoya Clinic, which is a free clinic provided by the medical students at Georgetown, so we specifically want to treat the clients of Prevention Works, which is the local syringe exchange here. And what we found is that 90% of our clients who knew about it actually went and accessed services. And so that's a big difference that medical students can make if you make us available and say, we really want to serve this community and the community knows that, they will access services. They also developed wound care info, which is more accessible to the needs of our particular population. And when people start complaining or start questioning, do we really need to provide all these different components to the wound care kit? It was the medical students who actually did a utilization review, so we had the data to say, yes, actually folks are using all the different components, therefore we need to still keep funding this. And then there are lots of little things that you can do. Some things that medical students notice is that dehydration was a big issue. And when you're dehydrated, it's harder to access a vein because they're less plump, so you're more likely to get an injury. And so what they did is they had a bottled water drive at school, and they also further supplemented that with a bake cell, which they used to buy bottled water. And that was a bit of advocacy in and of itself because it sort of explained to their colleagues why they're doing these bake cells, why they're having this bottled water drive. 
two examples of students making difference. One is the Hoya Clinic, which I already mentioned, and the other is his wound care pamphlet that was developed. Programs have developed very good program, a very good information. However, it didn't meet the needs of our patient population. 25% of our patient population is functionally illiterate. We needed something that was a little more user friendly. This is a multi-step program process in which we consulted staff, we consulted patients, and this is what we finally came up with. Here are some photos, here's a photo of students engaging in the bottled water drive. Here are some students also uh, mapping out medical homes for some of our patients. And one of the things I want to talk about is one of the things that we saw with the, with these students is they became very personally involved in that they recruited their friends to volunteer. They organized volunteer days for the new student orientations. They uh, started carrying condoms with them and giving them to their classmates. They started carrying Narcan with them, which is part of a service learning program. They gave a presentation on it, and two years in a row there were actions, and two years in a row, both years, the, the, the service learning program that served the syringe exchange program won first place. To me, this really says a lot because when you do advocacy in terms, of a, in terms of a petition or in terms of a walk, you're really trying to change hearts and minds, and you're not really sure if you do. But in this instance, with this very informal advocacy, we know that we changed hearts and minds because we got students, other students to contribute, other students to participate, and the other students acknowledged it by voting that uh, these, these service learning programs as the, 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 their favorite one two years in a row. A lot of different ways that you can get involved in addition to the ones I just mentioned. Um, writing grants, planting flowers. I know planting flowers seems a bit strange, but there's no better way of being a good neighbor than having curb appear, a curb appeal. Uh, doing an overdose cap study, uh, putting together information about uh, transgender clients. These are programs that projects that students have done for us that have been incredibly invaluable. And this last one I want to show you is mapping patients. So you see we've got sort of a diamond. This is what this, this is where patients are coming from within the District of Columbia. And if you look at Bryant, this is the second map is looking at the District of Columbia within the context of Maryland and Virginia. And this is important for two reasons. One is that it shows that people are driving hundreds of miles to access life-saving services. So the stereotype that injection drug users aren't drug users aren't interested in health is clearly a myth. And even though this was done in 2010, this is something that I actually still use this graphic today when I meet with senators from Maryland and Virginia to show them that this is an issue for their community and they need to live the ban for federal funding because people in their community need to be able to access these services too because they're driving hundreds of miles to D.C. and D.C. can't provide all the services. They can only provide some of them. They can do the syringe exchange, but can they do, it's very hard to do case management if you're in another state. It's very hard to do drug treatment or service referral if you're in another state. But guess who was, you know, the person who put together this beautiful graphic was a medical student. So this could be you. How can you make a difference? Well, one thing is to keep asking questions. We know that HIV testing should be offered, and what the students here in Washington notice is that in the emergency room, they were not offering HIV testing. And so the medical students say, why aren't you? And they didn't like the answers, and they kept asking questions. So because of medical students, we had HIV testing in our emergency department here at Georgetown. One of the things that other students noticed is that we didn't know what the overdose death rates were here in Washington, D.C., and they were met with resistance, told with those, that those numbers aren't available. And the students, being medical students, knew that wasn't the case. They said, well, what about coroner's reports? What about emergency room admissions? And they were told, well, no HIPAA. Because of HIPAA, we can't give you that information. And the medical students said, well, wait a minute, we know about HIPAA, and we're not asking for individual data. We're asking for aggregate data. Why, why are we getting this data? And because of the students pushing, we actually now know that there are two drug overdose deaths every week here in Washington, D.C. And having that exact information was incredibly important because it really helped encapsulate the, it brought attention to the issue, and more importantly, it brought, it brought resources to address that issue as well. So those are just two things that, that, that medical students can do, but also you can lead by example. Practice what you preach. Get tested, carry condoms, keep Narcan on hand. Narcan is a medication that is used to give people when they overdose on drug opiates. Um, there's no potential for abuse. The most it would cost you is $20. You can get it from any doctor. And then once you become a doctor, think about prescribing Suboxone and buprenorphine. Prescribe Narcan. You don't have to be a psychiatrist to, to prescribe either one of these drugs. In fact, most of the physicians I know who prescribe these drugs are actually family practice physicians.
And I just want to thank you. There's my contact information. If you need any help with anything, feel free to contact me online. And I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Um, are there any questions? And if someone can confirm that there's nothing I need to do on my end in terms of, of the technology to accept questions, let me know. Okay, so since there are no questions, I'm just going to thank you all very much. Um, again, if you have any questions or need any assistance, if you would like assistance making an appointment with your representatives on the House or, or the Senate side, if you'd like assistance with a region conference call with your Congressional Representative's Office here in Washington, D.C., if you'd like assistance putting together an event or any assistance uh, in terms of how to best serve your local certain services program, my contact information is listed, and I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us. Have a great weekend.